Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a much demanded and requested project update video for this 1.6 scale radio controlled Armortech Russian T3485 medium tank. Since the last video update, the vehicle's battery has been procured as well as the interior machinery layout has been beginning to flush out. We'll be going over all this information in this video. So stay tuned because there's going to be a lot of info coming at you. Well, it's felt like eternity since I worked on this one. As a quick recap, this model in the last video, I was able to hook up a battery system to it and get the model up and running for a test drive where the tank performed actually very, very well. At that point, the vehicle was ready for the next step of the build, which involved fleshing out the interior mechanical and electrical components. And this is where the problems began. Not necessarily with getting the thing to work, the problems began with acquiring the battery. Let me go ahead and bring the camera in so you get to see exactly what I'm referring to. With the camera off the tripod, you can see the interior space that I'm working with here. Now, a common misconception for anyone who's working on 1.6 scale radio controlled models is that, well, with the you know, large scale such as 1.6, you must have a cavernous amount of interior real estate in order to use in for mechanical systems and you can stuff in not only tons of mechanical parts but even interior detailing and other gizmos as well. And that is really not necessarily the case. Depending on the vehicle you're working on will affect your interior layout. For instance, if you're working on something like a Yag Tiger, for instance, or a King Tiger, you do have some more leeway with interior space compared to something like, say, an M5 Stewart or in this case, the T34. As you can see, trying to get everything stuffed into this vehicle here is going to be a chore and it's one that is going to require very careful planning and engineering just to accomplish this. For instance, the entire back here is dedicated to the motors and the main drive and we have here the main motherboard. Now with this generation of Armor Tech kit, this does simplify things slightly because both the motion pack, the power supply module, as well as the turret rotation equipment is all concealed in this control unit. On previous generations, this single box here was divvied up into three or four boxes that interconnected with each other. This is good or bad? Hard to say because in one aspect it's simpler because it's one unit you have to worry about mounting, but one advantage that the other ones perceivably has is that because they are separate you can screw them about on the inside of the interior thus possibly allowing you more space. With this one here, it's one single block so again this whole area here is going to be dedicated for this unit and this now leads us to the conundrum. The battery compartment as well as the speakers audio amplifier and the smoke system all need to somehow be fit into this hull. Not to mention the recoil system which more than likely is going to be fit into the turret but again this is more interior components that need to be mounted to this vehicle. Now one thing to point out about the T34 is that this is also true by the way you see on the 116 scale ones you cannot have a standard type of battery in this type of system because of the limited space. The T34 with its with its high angle design really cuts down on the interior space you have for mechanical systems. Even on the real vehicles getting inside was a chore for a full size person which is why the entire front hatch here was necessary. And just like I briefly touched upon with the 116, if anyone has the Tegan 116 scale T34, you'll know that a standard 7.2 battery won't fit inside. You actually have to get a strange nunchuck type battery but that's neither here nor there. So for this unit here, as we can recall from the other builds, to power an armor tech, they need to be 24 volt powered. And this is generally facilitated by, by pairing up two 12 volt batteries, hooking them up in series, giving you the 24 volts in order to power the model. Now in most vehicles, you can accomplish this by using a standard 12 volt, uh, 30 amp hour battery. It's the tall ones that you generally see in my videos. And that works by and large on most of the tanks out there. I've used them on Shermans, Panthers, Tigers, King Tigers, and so on and so forth. But for the T34 here, it's really not going to work. Instead, I have a new battery that I just picked up and I'm gonna show you exactly how it gets mounted and the possible benefits that it has for this system. For this vehicle, rather than going with the dual battery setup, which eats up a lot of space and possibly it's going to affect some of the interior layout, 
I went ahead and opted for a single 24 volt battery. This here is a lithium ion battery from the company Relion. Their link is found in the video description listed below. And this is the company that I've been using for a number of years now and their batteries are highly recommended. One of the benefits that the, that the lithium ion has is that one, it's so much lighter than lead acid. I mean, this thing is a feather of what a single lead acid battery weighs. And it's only, I'm going to be needing one of them as opposed to the two. The lithiums have longer runtime from my experience and from what I've been told. And they're just really more streamlined in many respects. Lead acid's really a dying technology in my opinion. Lithium is really the way of the future. They, these batteries do cost extra compared to a, in comparison to a lead acid, but you are getting more runtime, longer life. You don't have to worry about the thing sulf, uh, sulfating on you. They're just, they're better in just about every way possible. Now, generally in my, in my bills, I use you know the two and I hook them up to the series. This one here is going to be different. This one out of the box is a 24 volt battery or more precisely a 25.6 volt. It's 20 amp hour. Now some people are probably going to be wondering but John the tank is rated for 24 volt and this one's 25.6 isn't that going to cause problems? I was talking to the engineers over at Relyon and they told me that this battery here spec wise gives you the same performance as 24 volts as for why it's 25.6 there was some technical jargon that the guy was telling me and unfortunately I don't recall it for this video but suffice to say I believe that this will work with this armor tech system of course if there's a problem i'm going to definitely you know let you guys know but for, for the time being i briefly tested it with the rc systems and it seems to be okay now back to the battery at hand you'll notice that by going with a single battery it is wider or i should say slightly wider than a standard 12 volt battery but it's still thinner than having two of them stacked up side by side. With this, this greatly cuts down the amount of interior space getting gobbled up by the system. If I just drop this unit right into here and take the camera off the tripod, careful. This is going to <laughs> make some weird noises, but all right. You can see exactly how much little space this thing takes up. And again, for this type of vehicle, it's going to be very relevant. Now, in addition to the weight savings and the space savings, this thing is also going to cut down on a lot of the electrical wiring that gets put on the inside. Because I don't need that joiner wire that goes across connecting the two leads together, it's going to really cut down on the complexity in that aspect. Now, this tank is going to have a battery kill switch because you're going to need that when you're working on vehicles with these type of systems. But again, that's still easy to hook up with this type of system here. And it's slightly easier than it is with the other unit. With the other one, I have to incorporate somehow into the bridge and joint. That's really uh, the scope of this video. But suffice to say that the shutoff system is going to be easier with this type of configuration. But more on that will come. So you're asking, John, that's great. But why is it that this video was filmed basically a year after your last project update? Well, quite simply put, the situation happened, the one that I cannot really talk about because of YouTube demonetization, but it happened. And once it happened, it kind of screwed up production lines on just about everything from raw material supplies to batteries to you name it. And acquiring these batteries here was something that was delayed, unfortunately. But luckily I was able to get the battery in the shop. And with this battery now in hand, I could progress back on the T34. So with that out of the way, hopefully it will be worth it because now I'm going to go ahead and fabricate the interior battery mounts. For this, I'm going to be utilizing my standard configuration of I don't have any aluminum on hand, but I do have some aluminum angle that I'm going to be cutting to shape, fastening to the bottom of the hull, and then having a nice Velcro strap, which is hooked up to the aluminum, which will keep the battery firmly in place and prevent it from wandering around. Also, with the battery placement, you'll notice that it's thought out because I put it directly, mostly underneath the center mass of the turret. The turret being the heaviest part of the vehicle, the battery dead center underneath it does balance out the weight quite well with the vehicle overall during running. And with, of course, the weight evenly distributed, it's gonna put less wear and tear on the remainder of the tank suspension. If you have, you know, for instance, a lot of weight in the back, it's gonna put more, uh, it's gonna put more weight on the rear suspension. And this is why on a lot of builds you see them slightly 
angled backward or sometimes angled forward depending on where the batteries are located in the vehicle and also their weight. This is specifically true for lead acids. But if you generally mount the batteries in the center of the vehicle, the weight really is distributed evenly across all the suspension systems. Right now I'm going through the motions of assembling the battery box. I already have two of the main struts mounted on the inside of the tank. I'll pan the camera over to those shortly. But these two here are the more important ones. These ones are where the strap is going to slide in and it's going to actually keep the battery firmly in place. These are fabricated out of the aluminum that I mentioned before, that I may have mentioned before. And you can see that in order to add the strap I'm going to cut a small little slit into the aluminum here and another one's already being added to the opposite side. I already took some measurements and I went ahead and drilled out these portions here on the drill press just so it makes the cutting of the material just a little bit easier. To cut the material out I'm going to be utilizing this angle cr angle grinder that I have right here with a cutting blade on it and I'm just going to plunge cut and just remove the material accordingly. However, that's not really where it ends because then I need to make sure that the slit is nice and smooth like we have here to avoid obviously any sort of snag or ripping points if the metal is still nice and sharp. So with all that out of the way, I'm going to go ahead and add the slit to the piece right now. Well, as you can see, the end grinder did its job, and those multitude of smaller holes are now just one continuous slit. Now, you don't necessarily have to add all the multitude of holes like I did. In the past, I've even done the same procedure with just one hole in the beginning and one at the end, and then the end grinder just does the, the remainder of the work. The Adding the extra holes is just another technique that can be used intermixed with the other one. So, it's really up to your discretion. Although I will say that by adding the extra holes, it does put a little bit less wear and tear on the end grinder and the procedure goes by a little bit quicker. But in order to take it to the next step now, you can see that there's a lot of burrs and all sorts of jagged edges on this component right here. And this is less than ideal. So to polish up further, nothing beats a file and some good old fashioned elbow grease where I'm gonna go ahead and just level everything off and also deburr any sort of debris that still remains. So now that the slit has been cleaned up and the bird, I'm not quite out of the neck of the woods yet. To further smooth out these corners over here, one technique that I like to do is with some sandpaper, I like to go up and down these two intersections, which will polish them down further, which will really do a good job in removing any sort of burrs that will be remaining. So let me go ahead and re-put this in the vise, and you can see the procedure in live action. Just some 320 grit sandpaper. Just slide it into the slot here and you just polish away. It's real easy to tell when the procedure is done. You could just take your fingers and run them up and down these sections over here. And you'll easily be able to tell if there are any burrs or any other sort of sharp sections that are remaining. Right now, these sections here are totally smooth, which wraps that up. I am though going to polish a little bit of the bottom section here. 
just to cover all bases, really. So just slide the sandpaper in, polish away. And here's the battery, now mounted to the newly fabricated battery box. You can see how all the parts were fastened to the hull. Of course, Loctite is utilized to keep everything where it needs to be. For the retention, this is just done with this Velcro strap. does a great job of keeping everything nice and tied down where it needs to be. And it doesn't really add a whole lot of weight and there's not really a whole lot of complexity. The only thing that is mentioned, of course, is that little slit that I mentioned before or that you saw me cut into the aluminum. Battery just lifts straight out. And there's the box found here on the hull. But the combination of the angle aluminum and the nylon strap here, that's more than enough to keep the battery where it needs to be. Now that the battery is all done, the next item to fasten down is the main circuit board that we have here. And this is going to be fastened to the sponsons of the tank. And I'm going to be utilizing, or I should say recycling, this fastener on this side, and there's a one on the opposite side in the exact same location. To do this, I went ahead and fabricated these two mounts right here. Again, the material is angle aluminum. They've been cut and bent to shape. All I gotta do now is mark and drill out the appropriate holes and then get everything fastened together. Fast forwarding a little bit, here we have the main control board now fastened to the vehicle. You can see how I went ahead and engineered the mounts for that and how they fit to the vehicle in this setting. Pay no attention to the power switch. This is going to be sorted out shortly after the equipment that is fitted in this video, but you can see exactly how the unit fits in. It's nice and sturdy, keeps it up in a nice thin manner, low profile. It doesn't eat up too much space back here or towards the front, which <laughs> is going to be required because like I said before, free space on the inside of these vehicles gets gobbled up very quickly. With these two now out of the way, the next bit of equipment to fit is this little magic box that we have here. What this is, this is a battery shutoff switch. Now this is something that I strongly cannot recommend enough for anyone who's working on one of these large type of vehicles. If you do not have this, it's going to cause some problems with your model as the years go on. You see, with the current configuration here, if the battery was hooked up to the leads, even though the tank is off, you're actually still draining power. And this is going to come around and bite you when, like, say, like a year or two from now, you go to drive your tank, and the battery is going to be dead. So what this system does is isolates and kills the juice going into the system, and it completely isolates the battery, thus preventing any sort of loss. This unit here is one that I've been mentioning quite frequently in my recent Armor Tech build videos, and for good reason. It's very simple, it's very affordable, and on top of that, it's very easy to come by. This unit here I procured off of Amazon.com, and the link for this mechanism can be found in the video description listed below. Again, highly recommend for anyone who's working on one of these type of vehicles. One caveat, of course, is that this unit needs to be mounted to the model in a location that's easily accessible and is one that's large enough for you to fit your hand in in order to actuate this large knob. Well, luckily for the T-34, we have this jewel of an access point right here on the rear armored plate. Of course, any Tom, Dick, or Harry that knows a thing about the T-34 will tell you that this access hatch here is on the real vehicle because it's used to get access to the V-12 engine, but also, I believe, to the large blower fan that's found on the rear portion of the T-34. For this model here, I'm going to need to adapt this mechanism to fit into here in a way where it's accessible, however, it does not protrude from this section over here. Now, the way I'm figuring out how to do it is I believe I'm gonna fabricate an aluminum bracket that will fasten to this unit here, then it'll come out and bend down to the same angle here of the lower portion of the rear hull, and that's where it's gonna be bolted to the tank. So, I guess from here, let me go ahead and start cutting and bending some aluminum. Well, after some cutting, bending, and fitting, 
Here's the new bracket here. It's just made from, again, a piece of angle aluminum that I just custom bent to shape. It still needs to be drilled out for the mounting holes for both the unit as well as for it to be fitted to the vehicle, but I'll touch upon more of that in a moment. Before I can do that, I need to get this fellow here wired up. Now, the way these work is that we have a bottom plate here, which just pops right off, and inside we have our little fasteners. Here's what the unit looks like on the inside. We have two contact leads, and that's basically it. With the bolts taken out of the bag, we have just four Allen fasteners as well as four of these nylock fasteners. These are just used to hold the bottom plate to the main unit, and I'm also, of course, going to be using them for double duty in order to secure them to the aluminum bracket that I fabricated before. What's also nice about these units here is that they have these removable side panels. And these side panels are removable on all four sides, which is great because this gives you a lot of flexibility and modularity to the system where, you know, you can either drill holes in it or just remove the panel outright, whichever way, you know, you deem fit. And this is actually a really nice advantage because depending on the type of tank you're working on or your interior layout configuration, this might change, you know, where this unit gets fitted, so which way the wires really get connected to the unit. So that's a nice advantage that this set does have. When it comes to wiring this fella in, this patches into the ArmorTech battery leads that we have here. This here is the lead wire set that comes with the ArmorTech tank. However, you'll notice that the eyelets are way too small for not just this unit that we have here, but also for the units that are supplied with the battery. So chances are I'm probably going to be making a new battery lead for the use on this vehicle. The second thing is the way it actually connects is that you connect it to just one of these wires, preferably the positive lead. You just break the positive lead, one lead goes into the switch, the other one leaves the switch and continues to the battery or to the power source and you're good to go. And after a little bit of cutting, soldering and fastening, here goes the battery kill switch. Now fully assembled and at this point here it's ready for installation. All I have to do now is currently I have the lower portion of the tank's hull where this is going to be fixed marked. I'm going to drill that out, mark two corresponding holes here, drill, and this unit here is actually going to be tapped so I don't have to go in here with fasteners because with this severe angle trying to snake your hand inside that the tight confines there of the hull with the two motors in the way is definitely going to be something that is not going to be very easily done. So. That's why on this one here, I'm just going to thread these two sections over here, which then that means when it comes time for installation, I just thread the fasteners directly to this part and voila, I'm all ready to go. For the units themselves, like I said, they were just soldered together. I just soldered these large eye rings like this guy over here on the two leads and then they got fastened in place with the fasteners that were showcased before, the ones that are built into the unit. The remainder of the fasteners were utilized and again, everything at this point here is now ready for installation. So let's now cut across to when this fella here is fitted to the vehicle. Well, as promised, here you can see the unit now fully assembled and mounted to the vehicle. This is done via these three bolts that I have right here. Now all of these fasteners are going to be plugged up and sanded smooth with the bodywork. That also goes along with these two fasteners here that are from the original kit panels and how they go together, but more information on that is to follow. On the inside, you can see how it's nested nicely right between those two gearboxes. And you have plenty of access right here from the outside. Open the hatch, and boom. Now at this point here, the vehicle would be cut off. If you could see, hopefully this pops out on camera, there's that little green section right there. That is the unit on. So very easy to get to very problem free and very easily concealed. Now that the cutoff is installed, it's now time for me to work on the remainder of some of the connections, namely the battery connections as well as the recharge jack system. Here we have the power switch. This one here, I'm still trying to figure out where it's going to go. I can mount it either right underneath this section over here, which on the, on the vehicle we have the engine hatch. And then on this side here, we have the ductwork for the blower, which on the T-34, of course, is hinged. So there's a lot of axes back here to fit that. I could possibly even 
move it all the way up here to the front of the driver's hatch where you open up and boom, you have your main power switch right there. But this really more or less remains to be seen. From here though, let me go ahead and work now on the other wire connections that are needed to get the unit now patched in. Well, the wires have now all been connected and the system is now live. Unfortunately, at this point here, I'm not going to be able to create the recharge jack because, quite simply put, I don't have the necessary mail jacks on hand in order to fabricate this part, but this will be added as soon as the new parts come in. I have them on order, so in the next video update, this fella here is going to be wired up with the recharge system. But even without the recharge jack, you can see how everything is fitting together. Here we have the two connectors. Note I have the rubber boot connectors on them just to prevent any sort of mishaps of short circuits from happening. These things are really recommended by the way. I bought these uh, a few years ago off of eBay in a little bag that I have here. With any luck I should be able to find the vendor I purchased them from. They are really affordable and again they just do as advertised so highly recommended for anyone who's working on one of these type of builds. Moving back we can test the system. Note right now it's in the red and if I hit the power switch Absolutely nothing, and that's what you want to see at this point because the system has been disconnected. If I go ahead and spin this to green, hit the button, and now the system is on. Clearly with the machinery now mounted, this is a big step out of the way. From this point here, I can now flesh out the remainder of the tank's interior mechanical equipment, which is including, but it's not limited to, the smoke system, the audio amplifier and the two speakers which obviously like I said before is going to fill up the majority of the interior free space on this model and frankly this is probably the most challenging aspect of this entire build more so than just the exterior detailing in general so more information on the rest of this is going to come in the next video update when you're going to start seeing the inside here start fleshing out further and with that that wraps up this project update video for this 1-6 scale armor tech radio controlled Russian T-34-85 medium tank. If you like this video be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posted content being 1-6 scale project update videos like this fellow over here or the other smaller scale model showcase videos that frequently get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in loop of new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There, I have more photographs of this particular build that have been posted since the project start, as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that are showcased on this channel. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by eastcoastarmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Till next time, Das Vidanya.